November 1981, Azam and his family steps off a plane and they're now in the Pakistani city of Islamabad. Azam was now a representative of the Islamic University of Islamabad, but clearly, fighting just across the border in Afghanistan was where his real intentions laid. I mean, as soon as Azam was on Pakistani soil, he would begin to form connections with the many Mujahideen leaders, including Uprab al Rasul Saif and Jalal al Din Haqqani. But when he wasn't spending his time with Afghan Mujahideen leaders in the city of Peshawar, he was teaching in the university halls of Islamabad. And just like in Jordan, Azam was popular with his students in Pakistan too, at times taking them to look at the Afghan refugee camps from the Soviet-Afghan conflict. A conflict that started off as a power struggle between Muhammad Dawood Khan and Zahir Shah, where then Muhammad Dawood Khan would coup Zahir Shah with some help from the local communist. Khan would then see an insurgency against him by Islamist rebels calling themselves the Mujahideen, and during this time, Dawood would be overthrown by communists in the Saur Revolution. Taraki's government would then try to form a communist state, and one way how this communist state was supposed to be set up was through a series of reforms, including agrarian reforms. Did I say that right? Taraki was very bad at doing agrarian reforms, or to be honest, keeping a positive relationship with the many conservative and religious elements within Afghanistan. One thing the Taraki government was great at doing was crushing opposition, mostly by killing, arresting, torturing, or disappearing that opposition. Wait, did I say they were good at doing that? No, they're also pretty bad at doing that. Because every time they arrested, tortured, killed, or disappeared someone, people would just go off to the mountains to join the Mujahideen, either in Pakistan or in the Afghan mountains. Or in some cases, the Pakistani mountains. To Nur Muhammad Taraki, he was going to bring communism to Afghanistan, whether or not Afghans were kicking and screaming. No surprise here, but the insurgency and discontent with Taraki's government would only continue, especially with Pakistani support. The insurgency would only intensify, and Nur Muhammad Taraki would be usurped by Hafizullah Amin. Hafizullah Amin would kind of piss off his Soviet allies, but would still ask for Soviet support against the Mujahideen fighters. And the Soviets would then move into Afghanistan. Oh wait, I mean they would intervene in the conflict at the request of Amin. Where then they shot Amin in the face and anyone who was loyal to him in his presidential palace. Before placing the country under the control of Barbara Kamal. The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan would now pique the interest of the United States and almost every regional power. Now this civil war in Afghanistan was turning into a proxy conflict between the USSR and regional powers and the United States. Abdullah Azam would have no issue putting his weight into this conflict too, a weight that we still feel until today. In the anti-communist non-Muslim West, the Afghan struggle was being painted as national resistance against communist oppression and that the Afghans would have to fight for their own national liberation. But in many parts of the Muslim world, this conflict was being painted as Muslims being oppressed by the godless communists that took aim at the Afghan people's religion, Islam, and that only Jihad would push out the Soviets. And as the conflict would intensify and gain more international support and media coverage, Afghan Mujahideen leaders would begin to hold talks across the Muslim world. For the most part, these Afghan Mujahideen leaders would try to push for fundraising and gaining more arms. But some some Afghan Mujahideen leaders, looking at you Mr. Haqqani and Mr. Saif, would call for foreign fighters to come fight for their factions. Now no surprise here, but many of these talks would be held within Saudi Arabia, but it wasn't only limited to Saudi Arabia. As this video will show, the armed Islamist movements were now going international, where borders didn't matter to them, only ideology and faith. These talks held by the Afghan Mujahideen leaders, along with the general anti-communist pro-Mujahideen sentiments within many circles of the Muslim world, would begin to rally behind this struggle. And while this video will mostly be talking about foreign fighters that I will be calling the Afghan Arabs, support for the Mujahideen came in many ways. Doctors would show up, engineers would show up, donations were very important, humanitarian and NGO groups would be formed, all in the name of helping the Afghan Muslims against the Soviets. Some of these doctors and engineers, well, they turned out to be terrible people. And many of these movements would either gain money or support or actual members from countries like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Pakistan, and the United States to name a few countries. Heck, some countries would even ease the restrictions for flights going to Pakistan. Because whatever you do at the Afghan-Pakistani border is none of the airliners concern. And especially during this time, the early stages of the Afghan-Arab era, which is what I'm gonna call it, okay, 
most of these guys didn't have to worry about a government clampdown against them, as almost every country in the region was supporting the Mujahideen one way or another, and kind of saw these Afghan Arab fighters as somewhat random but generally overhyped people that were helping in a general anti-Soviet cause. And for some governments, they would use the Afghan Arabs as a middleman between them and the Afghan Mujahideen leadership. Though the Afghan Mujahideen leadership and Arab governments were already pretty close. Heck, in some cases, these Afghan Arabs would help their governments. Azam himself was too skeptical of any Muslim government, and Muslim governments were pretty skeptical of someone like Abdullah Azam. Azam would view these Muslim governments as un-Islamic, and these governments would view Azam as a possible political foe in the future. As Abdullah Azam would state, No tyrant has power over me, and no interest ties me to any Arab state, even with Jordan, whose nationality I hold. I haven't been to Jordan in four years. I haven't seen my house in a man, nor my family in this period. No power on earth can exert psychological, moral, or material pressure on me even Pakistan, whose land I live on. For if they come after me, I'll just go into Afghanistan. We're on the general topic of Arabs, Arab governments, Afghan Arab fighters, Arab volunteers, Arab money and Arab guns. I think it's very important that I should state, while I do use the term Afghan Arab, not all Afghan Arabs were Arabs. I don't want to erase any other group that were a part of the Afghan Arabs. Some of you may be asking, why am I using the term Afghan Arab instead of foreign fighter? Well, that's because Afghan Arab sounds cool, and I may or may not have written Afghan Arab over 50 times in the script before realizing my mistake. But back to the video. I mean, at one point in 1989, you would have a lot of Southeast Asian fighters. I mean, look at this quote. I have a lot of quotes for this video, okay? There was something called the Arab Front. No, the place was filled with Indonesians, Malaysians, Filipinos, Turks, and American black Muslim fighters. And if that doesn't yell diversity, I don't know what does. That being said though, no surprise here, most Afghan Arabs were Arabs. A lot of the heavy propaganda effect was in Arabic. A lot of the connections you could do were in Arabic or were from Arabs, so no surprise here. This is also where I have to do a tad bit of myth busting. I'm pretty sure you guys have all heard of the viewpoint by now that the US had created Al-Qaeda and the Taliban by doing things like Operation Cyclone. And while with many myths there's some kernel of truth here and there, overall, no, this is not historically correct. I mean, the Taliban was formed after the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan. And while yes, some Mujahideen leaders did join or become allies with the Taliban until today, many Mujahideen leaders would fight against the Taliban and ally with the US all the way up until today. We especially saw this during the fall of Kabul to the Taliban in 2021, where you had groups like the Haqqani Network, which was formed by Jalal al-Din Haqqani, fight with the Taliban, but you also had Mujahideen leaders like Ismail Khan who fought against the Taliban. The Mujahideen leaders were very diverse in their ideas, and to paint them all with one brush is not fair. The Al-Qaeda party is also incorrect, as Afghan Arabs tended to not work with what they viewed as non-Muslim Westerners, Crusaders, and secularists. And for the most part, the Afghan Arabs were pretty self-reliant or got their gear from other Muslim groups, governments, or factions. Afghan Arabs, for the most part, had their own money, their own trainings, their own guns, you guys got it. The higher up Afghan Arabs tried their best to be separate from non-Muslims. This is something Afghan Arab fighters would even do on an individual level. On top of that, the Pakistani ISI tended to pick who got the guns and who got the training, not the CIA. The CIA, for the most part, would view these Afghan Arabs as insignificant to the war effort. Funny enough, Osama bin Laden would even have to dispute this whole, the CIA made Al-Qaeda thing. Another funny thing is Al-Qaeda had to dispute the whole Bush did 9-11, the 9-11 truther thing, which is kind of funny. It's like that Onion article. But back to the video once again. I mean, if Abdullah Azam didn't trust Muslim governments, then it's pretty safe to say Abdullah Azam had no interest with working with Western security services. These are things he hates, especially the United States and other Western non-Muslim what he would view as crusading and secular governments too. Azam would even dislike Western non-Muslim medical NGOs. And while some medical NGOs did go to Afghanistan with the aim of converting the local Afghan population to Christianity, which no surprise here would piss off a lot of Afghans, 
Azam saw most to all, religious are secular, non-Muslim medical NGOs as crusaders are secularists in Muslim lands that were going to strip the Afghans of their Islamic morals and convert these Afghans into Christianity and barbarism. Azam was successful in having Afghans shun, at times these already established and well supplied non-Muslim doctors after Azam would get his own doctors. As we could see, brother Abdullah Anas came to us from Mazari Sharif and said, we only need one Arab doctor to expel the French team from there. And then I kind of skipped through a few of the quotes. Dr. Salhi, I don't know if I butchered his name, arrived in Mazari Sharif. The frontline commander there, Abdullah, who was in charge of over 1,000 Mujahideen, issued a fatwa saying that it was no longer permissible for a Muslim to sit with the French, speak to them, or be treated by them. For now, the Arabs had arrived. If you want to break this down to a very brutal form, Abdullah Azam at times would kick out doctors and prevent doctors from moving into a combat zone to help wounded Afghans because they were non-Muslim and Abdullah Azam would have a clash of civilization type viewpoint between Muslims and non-Muslims in their many plots against Muslims and Islam. On top of that, you'd have multiple cases of Afghan Arabs attacking non-Muslim Western volunteers and journalists, viewing them as crusaders and people who are in Muslim politics when they should be staying out and so on. People are also layered. Abdullah Azam didn't try to force out all non-Muslims and he even interacted with some, but for the most part it seems like he just tolerated them instead of like enjoyed being in their company. But don't forget we're still talking about this myth and this is just simple evidence to support my conclusion. Now this isn't me saying that the US did not supply extremist Islamist groups. They did. The US would give support to Hekmetyar and Haqqani, and both of these guys would fight against US forces until Hekmetyar signed a peace treaty in 2016 with the Afghan government, or ex-Afghan government now, and Haqqani would fight US forces until he died in 2018. I mean the US would even help print and spread Islamist propaganda across the Muslim world, and the US didn't mind when Islamists like Abdullah Azam would visit the US to recruit fighters and have people donate to his cause. I mean if someone still wants to blame the US for setting up an environment of where groups like Al Qaeda and the Taliban could be formed, well then blame would have to be put on Pakistan, blame would have to be put on Iran, China, the USSR especially. Here we got Egypt and Israel along with the Saudis because these countries would also create an environment for Al Qaeda and the Taliban to flourish. But you guys can do whatever you want. I'm a dude on YouTube. I don't even have like a PhD history major or minor or whatever the terms people use. But back to the video. Now the Afghan Mujahideen and Afghan Arabs were pretty media savvy. Whenever they could, the Mujahideen would highlight Soviet war crimes and the Afghan refugee crisis to show how bad the Soviets were, while at the same time they would smile and be nice to the cameras of journalists. And this propaganda effect was very effective. Many rich Arab donors would physically fly to Pakistan and then visit these refugee camps where these rich donors would then hand out money, food, and you guys get it. I mean Osama bin Laden was a very early donor to this cause and Ayman al-Zawahiri would do medical work in these refugee camps. That being said, the Arab donors who physically went to Pakistan weren't huge in numbers. Heck, for the most part, Afghan Mujahideen leaders wanted Arab money and arms instead of Arab fighters. These Afghan leaders had more than enough Afghans to pick from. Now this is where I have to do a tad bit of myth busting. There's this impression that the Afghan Arabs were like the special elite forces for the Afghan Mujahideen. And these myths tend to revolve around combat and combat roles. Well, the Afghan Arabs in a very blunt way weren't militarily significant. Now I'm not saying that Arab volunteers and Arab money and funds and so on and so forth weren't important to the Afghan war effort. It was very important to the Afghan war effort, but if we're just talking on the topic of Afghan Arabs in a military context, then they were militarily insignificant. I mean heck, one of the co-founders of MEC, Abdullah Anis, would say that only 300 Afghan Arabs were permanently fighting in Afghanistan while a former British intelligence officer would put the number at 300 to 400. But if someone still wants to see an increased number of Afghan Arabs, we could look at 1988 and 1989 where the number of Afghan Arabs rose to about 7,000. But already by this time, the Soviets were pulling out of Afghanistan and the direct Soviet portion of the war was coming to an end. One reason this uh, myth has somewhat sprung up is because there was a lot of Arab coverage of Afghan Arabs which gave the impression that Arabs were doing a massive role in the war. Afghan Arabs kinda were overblown for a lack of better words. 
and the Afghan Arabs would help with this overblowing of their presence as they would also release their own propaganda. The media war was very important and Abdullah Azam would play a massive role in this. Abdullah Azam would begin to release more writings and more magazines. He would hold lectures that would glorify the Afghan Jihad along with recruiting Afghan Arabs to fight in Afghanistan. Azam wasn't the only Arab helping in this de facto Arab world to Afghan pipeline. The Arab volunteer pipeline at this time had no structure. But Abdullah Azam's status of being a humble Arabic speaking highly educated Islamic sheikh that was able to form positive relationships with the various Afghan Mujahideen leaders would make him one of the de facto heads of organizing the Afghan Arabs into Afghanistan and Pakistan. But just like being a popular person, if you know a lot of people, you're gonna get pulled into the drama. And Abdullah Azam would quickly be pulled into the various factionalism within the Afghan Mujahideen. Now, Afghan Mujahideen leaders and groups and factions were all divided by multiple things. Some groups were divided by tribal or religious lines, ethnic and social lines, but also ideological and, and regional lines. Some Afghan Mujahideen groups had all tribal and ethnic groups within them, while others had issues with maybe a Shiite group or a Sunni group. But because this video is talking about Abdullah Azam, we're going to be talking about the big important factions within his life. And the big Sunni factions were called the Pesharwa Seven. Big surprise here, but there were seven of them, which included, yeah, I'm gonna butcher some names, I'm sorry. Burhanuddin Rabani, Gold bin Hekmetiyar, Yunus Khalis, Ahmed Galani, Sabitullah Mujahidi, Muhammad Nabi Muhammadi, and Abra Rasul Saif. And during this time in Afghanistan, Abdullah Azam would work tirelessly to unite the Afghan Mujahideen factions under a single banner with little to no success. Now the previously stated causes of division for the Mujahideen factions were now being exacerbated. Why you may ask, well the question now became, how are we going to distribute the newly donated and acquired gear, money, and fighters? And when people try to divide the loot, especially when they don't trust each other, conflict will arise. And don't take this as me saying that the Afghan Arabs were above this factionalism. No they weren't. Many Afghan Arabs tended to interact with Gold bin Hekmetiyar and didn't fight in the Panjshir Valley. Now I have to give a little bit of background drama information here. Hekmetiyar and Ahmed Shah Massoud would both dislike each other, butting heads with each other multiple times. Now since the Afghan Arabs tended to, you know, interact with Hekmetiyar the most, many Afghan Arabs would begin to distrust and dislike Masood. I mean, at one point, Afghan Arabs would even start claiming that Masood was a French spy that had a big pool with a whole bunch of French women in bikinis around him and that he's not a real Mujahideen leader. And this is something Abdullah Azam and Abdullah Anas would have to work together on stopping. But during this time, Abdullah Azam, along with many Afghan Arabs, weren't above this factionalism, especially towards Masood. Another shocker for the Sheikh, Abdullah Azam, was that he would find out that the info he had on the Afghan Mujahideen faction's effectiveness and combat readiness was incorrect at times. And Abdullah Azam would begin to restructure and reorganize how he divided his gear, men, and support. The Afghan Mujahideen infighting would then pull Abdullah Azam in as Abdullah Azam would bump heads with Afghan Mujahideen leader Abdul Rab El Rasul Saif when Azam would begin to relax his support for the group because they weren't as combat effective as other groups like Hikmat Yars. Abdullah Azam would then accept a policy of directly sending in Arab caravans full of supplies, medical volunteers along with foreign fighters who would have to work as negotiators into Afghan Mujahideen territory. Other than just, you know, directly supporting the Mujahideen in the Afghan population, these caravans would also help Azam as these caravans at times would work at negotiating and unifying the Afghan Mujahideen even if it's just for a short while and he would use these caravans as a way of keeping up to date with many of the Afghan Mujahideen politics and changes. Another thing that Abdul Azam would stress a lot is that people within his caravan would have to follow what the Afghan Mujahideen told them to do. From Azam's point of view, the Afghan Arabs were guests to the Afghan House of Afghanistan and that the Afghan Mujahideen were already fighting the Soviets and were already effective at fighting. Now to show how much Abdullah Azam cared about this rule and this viewpoint, at one point Arab fighter Abdullah Anas would recite Qur'an verses in a different Qur'an from what the Afghan fighters would recite. Look at this quote, I got a lot more. 
we had to be extremely sensitive to the needs of the Afghans. And then I skip forward a little bit. Sheikh Abdullah Azam was out with Aprab Rasul Al Saif, and we were in the camp when the night prayer Isha entered upon us. The Mujahideen put me forward to lead the prayer. And so I led the men in prayer and everyone in the village could hear my voice. After the prayer, Sheikh Abdullah Azam and Abrab Rasul Al Saif came in and asked who led the men in prayer. So one of the fighters responded by saying, This Algerian here. Didn't I tell you, said Sheikh Abdullah Azam, tongue in cheek, that this recitation isn't the way the Afghans recite the Quran? And then the quote goes into details about how Abdullah Anas was lectured in his reflection on it, but you guys get the point. Abdullah Azam did not want the Afghan Arabs to step over the Afghan Mujahideen. And in this case, Abdullah Azam did not want Arab fighters to impose Arab cultural tendencies and norms on their Afghan allies, as this might alienate them and cause conflict. Supplying rebel groups and organizing armed fighters and medical runs, and you guys get the point, cost a lot of money. Azam would travel and lobby across the Muslim world, trying to gain more donations and supporters. Azam would, no surprise here, lobby within Muslim circles. He would especially go to Islamic charity events and would talk to Islamists from all over the Muslim world. Azam was able to use his connections that he formed back in the Middle East in his younger days, along with his high Islamic education and the fact that he fought in Palestine and Afghanistan to help raise his status, which in turn would raise the numbers of donation. Azam during this time would even begin to organize his own group called the Service Bureau, also known as Maktab al kidamat which would be established in 1984. Maktab al kidamat was now established. It had the goals of helping the Afghan Jihad, but I should also state that the goal of Mek weren't purely military goals. Azam wanted the group to become a type of advisor, logistic support, and educational support for the Jihad. And while donors did help with the funding of Mac, a rich son of a famous Saudi construction company named Osama bin Laden, in a very brutal way, would help set up and form Mac due to the money he would give to Azam. Osama and Azam both knew each other possibly since Indianapolis, but for sure knew each other within Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. Azam was also the man who helped convince Osama bin Laden from being a donor to the Afghan Jihad to being a fighter in the Afghan Jihad, but that would come later on. During this time, Osama bin Laden was just a guy that would show up to Pakistan to see how the funds and money were being used correctly before going back to Saudi Arabia or whatever bin Laden did. I mean both of these guys were very supportive of the Afghan Jihad so it shouldn't be out of character that these guys would do something like this. Azam and Osama during the 1984 Hajj season would convince Afghan Mujahideen leader Abdel Rab al Rasul Saif to allow the MEC to operate within Peshawar. MEC would start off with about 10 members. And from what we can see, MEC appears to have done its job pretty good, as Osama bin Laden would have to rent out more and more property to house more and more foreign fighters. So much so that Osama would even open up a second office in Quetta, Pakistan, where the group would organize medical work and send fighters to Kandahar. While Mac continued to send in caravans and delegates and fact finders into Afghanistan to keep Mac up to date on Afghan developments. At times, these caravans would return successfully to Pusharwa being sources of information and pride or in other cases were completely wiped out by Soviet troops and ambushes. These caravan runs into Afghanistan were also used as propaganda in the anti-Soviet war effort for the Afghan Arabs. This would also teach other Islamists on combat tactics, especially when Mac would release and create the Al Jihad magazine. These publications from Mac, along with Azam's own writing, would begin to highlight Soviet war crimes. They would also highlight Mujahideen victories. There would be talks of miracles with fighters escaping death from unnatural ways, mostly no surprise here through the will of God, martyrs giving off a beautiful must when they died, as seen from this video. And of course, they would highlight the human cost of the war on Afghan civilians. Azam's writing especially talked about the glory and miracles of becoming a Shaheed or Martyr. And Azam's writings would have effect on the topic of martyrdom within Sunni Islamist circles that shouldn't be ignored until today. Azam's writings would help highlight and glorify martyrdom
Now this isn't me saying that Abdullah Azam created the topic of martyrdom within the religion of Islam but Abdullah Azam would popularize it for Sunni Islamists who were fighting in armed conflicts. As said from this quote I pulled up, I always had Azam's books and tapes with me. In them he speaks of paradise, the glory of jihad, the afterlife as the great manifestation of the almighty. His stories invoke the mysterious power of the mujahid who does not feel pain of his injuries when he falls a martyr. His words echoed by the stories of jihadists who tell their miracles when they return to Jeddah. Now this isn't to say that Abdullah Azam's writings of miracles and all that stuff wasn't controversial. It was very controversial. Heck, some Islamists would view Azam's writing as nothing but fairy tales that they would laugh at. While Thomas Highammer in his book would even talk about how Azam might have been influenced by Sufi writings and ideas without him realizing it. And Azam, just like with his speech, was very charismatic. Al Jihad, the magazine, went international, having readers from all over the Arab world, the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, other parts of the Asian world you could think of. West Africa had readers, Europe had readers, and even the United States had readers. Funny enough, El Jihad would even have an interview with famous British singer and songwriter Yusuf Islam, also known as Cat Stevens. Now let me explain how Yusuf Islam kinda got caught up in all of this. Now Yusuf Islam wanted to help Afghan refugees and he would visit Pakistan in the city of Peshawar. Now I'm willing to bet that if you're a Muslim who is doing NGO work, you're going to bump into a Zam or someone who works with a Zam. This would happen to Yusuf Islam, where while he was in Pesharwa, he would meet a Zam, get interviewed, and apparently sang a few nasheeds for the Mujahideen there. No surprise here, famous songwriters weren't the only people to show up. Fighters would show up, imams would show up, doctors would show up, and even journalists would begin to come to Afghanistan, including a very famous journalist called Jamal Khashoggi. The magazines weren't the only thing to go international. As I said earlier, Azam would go around the world holding lectures to gain more donations, more fighters, and other volunteers and medical and things of that sort. Azam would go to places within Saudi Arabia like Jeddah, Riyadh, and especially Mecca during the Hajj and Umrah seasons. Azam would also go to the country of Kuwait, and Azam would even go to American cities like Los Angeles, Detroit, and Kansas City to name a few. Azam also went to Germany and to the city of Doha, all in the name of gaining Muslim solidarity and support for the Afghan Jihad. Azam would still face issues though. Azam tended to be barred from Arab republics like Libya, Egypt, Syria, and Iraq. Now no surprise here, Azam wrote a lot. If you go to that many colleges and you sacrifice that much for education, you're most likely a writer. And Azam wrote. Now Azam writing it is very hard to pinpoint to one certain idea or group. Azam tended to mix a lot of things together. Azam would mix Muslim Brotherhood viewpoints in theories and terms with Salafi viewpoints, theories and terms, along with adding in Tabliki Jamaat viewpoints and terms, so there's a lot of mixture of things. Azam, from what I could tell, really didn't care who was giving the information, he only cared if the information made sense to him. One thing for sure without a doubt is that Abdullah Azam was a pan-Islamist. Azam tended to view the world as a us versus them situation where it's Muslims against the horde of non-Muslims and their plots against Islam and Muslims. And just like with many conspiracy theorists people, Azam would have in my opinion some valid criticisms of Western and Soviet policy towards groups of Muslims, but Azam was also a huge conspiracy theorist. Azam would cite anti-Semitic tropes, especially from the Elders of Zion, which I should state the Elders of Zion is not a historically accurate source, don't use the source, it's a garbage source. Azam within his writings, no surprise here if you watch part 1, would always mention non-Muslim plots in their ideas and attempts to undermine Islam 
with things like crusader plots to weaken Islamic morals and what he would call a Jewish crusader alliance to take down Islam. Now this should be a huge surprise to anyone, but Islam would want to help establish a Islamic state within Afghanistan and then from Islam's point of view, this Islamic state would begin to export a Sunni Islamic revolution somewhat like Iran to the Sunni Muslim masses. The Sunni Muslim masses would then overthrow, or if they can't overthrow, get support from a Islamic state to overthrow their leaders that are employed by the West and non-Muslims and to get rid of plots against the Muslim world and Islam, especially within the country of Palestine. Islam would also begin to embrace a new viewpoint of Jihad, and I'm talking about the physical one, not the other two. Now, the jurisprudence, if Muslim lands are occupied or if Muslims are being violated from their rights, then Muslims can do jihad to not be occupied or to gain their rights. This might be a huge shocker, but Azam would hold this viewpoint. But Azam would kind of build onto this viewpoint. Now, within jihad, there are certain, uh, I guess what you could call authorities you have to go to to get approval to calling a jihad. Within Azam's viewpoint, you did not need all these authorities to do jihad. Some viewpoints would say that you need a government, an amir, or the ulama to give you jihad. Well, Azam's viewpoint would be that some of these governments and amirs and the ulama are corrupted or being controlled by someone else, so that the Muslim, and on an individual level, will have to do jihad on their own call. And this would be an opening of Pandora's box later on. Now within Azam's other ideological formations on how to conduct and do jihad, Azam would begin to say that jihad was a fard or mandatory for all Muslims to do if they had the opportunity to do it, independent of scholars and government's wishes. Azam would especially declare this in 1985, but this viewpoint was already being formed. Look at these two quotes I found. Azam would say, My brother, the ulama have ruled with consensus that if a small piece of Muslim land is infringed upon, the jihad becomes an individual obligation on the people of that location. And if the people of the country are too few, fall short, or are idle, then the duty extends to the next one, and so on, and so on forth, until the obligation, until it covers the whole earth. Azam would also write, Know that your Amir has no power over you to prevent you from jihad or to seduce you to abandon jihad by propagating da'wah and keep you away from the battlefield where men are made. Never ask for anyone's permission to do jihad. The viewpoint that Azam is giving out would have very long lasting effects. Azam would open Pandora's box on the topic of jihad within the late 20 to current 21st century discussion. And if you guys didn't notice, especially with the first part, Azam wanted to show that his opinion was a widely accepted viewpoint with many of the religious scholars and ulama. Azam's viewpoint wasn't. Azam's new jihad viewpoint was highly controversial with every corner you could think of. Heck, in some cases, fighters' parents would go all the way to Pakistan to hunt down for their children, fearing that Azam was undermining their authorities. Islamic scholars, especially Islamic scholars within the Sahwa movement, would disapprove of Azam's fard ruling of jihad and his support of ignoring ulama and religious authorities, feeling that this would open Pandora's box and it would also undermine their control. On top of that, especially within, I guess you could say, Wahhabi and Salafi circles, there were levels of doubt towards Afghan practices of Islam, especially with things like wearing Quran verses and things of that sort. You also just had, in some cases, level of distrust due to American support for the Mujahideen, feeling that maybe these Islamists were set up to become US proxies in the future. Heck, even Islamists would disagree with Abdullah Azam's farther viewpoint on jihad. For example, Pakistani Islamists who bordered Afghanistan especially had issue with viewing jihad as a farda for them. As said within another quote I found, On one of our trips to Karachi, I was in another meeting with Azam, and a debate erupted between him and Taqiq Uthmani, the Mufti of Jamati Islami. This sheikh was denouncing the motion that jihad is fard ayyain. He said that it's not fard ayyain, it's fard kifaya. For the sake of not making this video longer than I know it's going to be, now I'm going to oversimplify a lot of Azam's viewpoints on tactical restraints and what is a war crime and what is good and what is bad. I'm for sure people are going to think that I'm pulling up a bunch of random stuff, but I swear to God, this all comes back in the end, okay? Azam would also have rulings on how to conduct a uh, jihad which I will be brutally oversimplifying. Now, Azam tended to follow the traditional Islamic jurisprudence on conducting jihad. Very famously, I'm for sure, 
a lot of you guys have seen the rules on how to do jihad. Now, Azam believed in conventional warfare between militaries who wore uniforms and fought each other for controls of cities. But this isn't to say that Azam did not believe in paramilitary and insurgent tactics. He's an Afghan Mujahideen fighter, so of course he believes in those tactics. Now, on to the uh, oversimplification. Azam did not support the killing of civilians, well, he did support the killing of Afghan communist women. Azam would especially oppose bombing civilian targets, and his number two, Tamim al Adnani, would oppose hijackings, as seen within this interview. To USA, but I noticed that some people here uh, from ex lectures they had misunderstand the word Mujahideen. They, they have bad information or bad understanding, or let's say misunderstanding to that word. They think Mujahideen are people who attack people, just you know or have hijacked planers, hijacked planes, aircrafts, like those who hijacked the Kuwaiti aircraft. We are against this completely. This is not jihad. This is nonsense. Jihad is fighting for the sake of Allah, fighting for the path of Allah to protect our religion. We make jihad against those who prevent us from performing our you know, religion or from following our uh, divine revelation. Now this isn't to say that Abdullah Azam followed the Geneva Convention. He was not a Geneva Convention guy and for sure was not a Geneva Suggestion guy. Azam's viewpoint tended to be, this is aligned with Islamic jurisprudence or no, well I don't have to follow it. Azam would use masjids, ambulances, and a convoy to move around or store weapons and fighters, which is very illegal to do. Heck, Azam would say this himself when he said, we had a mosque or a pre-gola and inside the mosque we train with mortars, we train with anti-aircraft artillery. I told them, what is greater than this inside the mosque? Zikwiak inside the masjid, missiles inside the mosque, a mortar inside the mosque. This is what some people would call rap snitches telling all their business. Within Azam's viewpoint, the Geneva Convention is not based off Islamic jurisprudence. So as long as he wasn't breaking Islamic jurisprudence, in his eyes, he wasn't doing anything bad. And while it's very safe to say Azam did not support the killing of civilians for a war effort, Azam did, for a lack of better words, to be honest, these are the best words to say, Azam allowed collateral damage. There's a lot of irony in the sentence I just said, so I'ma let the audience do all the jokes for me. And just like with any writing, interpretations will vary on your writings. Azam's work is no different. I mean, Azam had his own interpretation of jihad, and people have interpretations of Azam's viewpoints on how to conduct his jihad. This is one reason why people like Abdullah Anas would say that Abdullah Azam would have never supported the 9-11 attack, as they go against the hijackings and the killings of civilians, while Osama bin Laden himself would view this as following Abdullah Azam's viewpoint to its conclusion. But this is something I will cover more in the next video. Even with my explanation of Abdullah Azam's Islamist viewpoint, Abdullah Azam wasn't the only person to hold Islamist viewpoints. And just like with any political idea that stretches the globe, viewpoints vary. And in this case, Abdullah Azam was the moderate counterweight to more extreme factions of the Afghan Arab. Even with the success of Mech and the Afghan Arabs and all that other stuff, the group would still have his own problems by 1985. Mech and Azam were beginning to face criticism. Mech would gain the criticism of not being a direct combat group. Mech was formed not as a combat oriented group, but as more of a logistic organization and if combat needs be combat but also advising role. And even when Mech would funnel fighters into Afghanistan, these fighters were ordered to follow Afghan Mujahideen leadership and not act independent of that. This is where other criticism was raised, as some Afghan Mujahideen leaders would view these Afghan Arab fighters as immature, glory-seeking, sometimes stuck-up nuisances, which by some accounts are very true. Some Afghan Arab fighters did not care about the cultural or religious practices and differences with the Afghans. Some of these Afghan Arabs did not care about the military organization or hierarchy that they had to follow, and in some cases, Afghan Arabs would only fight for a few days before going back home to tell their buddies how they did jihad. And during this time, you would have a growing set of Afghan Arabs who wanted to, and I quote, be like Sylvester Stallone. In a way to say a criticism of Mech could also be seen in my opinion as criticism of Azam's viewpoint. 
One huge criticism of Azam was that he was more ideologically driven, while many of the combat-driven Afghan Arabs wanted to see more physical fighting. The mech during this time would also have issues. At times, fighters would find themselves being sent off to combat zones with little to no guidance. He also had complaints of insufficient pay and internal conflicts would break out between members. The Al Jihad magazine would even receive criticism that it was not up to the standards of journalism, which is pretty interesting to say. I mean, the whole point of this magazine is to convince people to do jihad, but here we are. Mech also had issues of keeping some fighters in line. I mean, that's the whole thing about the Afghan leadership and Afghan Arab tension. And he also had rising concerns that the Mech group was coming subservient to one of its biggest donors, Osama bin Laden. Shura councils at times would become areas of contentions and debate. In that angelic viewpoint of the Arab Mujahideen, the warriors of God who left their lives to do jihad in Afghanistan and defend Muslim land were not hit by the realities of politics and human nature. And when Abu Ekram, who was the current executive director of Mech, left the group for one reason or another, all the issues of Mech would only continue. Criticism against Abdullah Azam was that he was too ideologically minded and at times would sweep issues under the rug. And for those that don't know, if you don't address the elephant in the room, the elephant will be on everyone's shoulder. In 1985, Abu Hajr al-Iraqi would be elected as the executive director of the Mech group and Abu Hajr al-Iraqi would have some ideas on which way Mech should go. The Mech would begin to see a shift where a more military minded and combat oriented operations would be executed. Mech began to send in more Afghan Arabs into the combat zones of Afghanistan. Now to show you the ideological spread I guess you could say of the Mujahideen and how much Afghan Arabs interacted with everybody Body, Afghan Arabs would be sent into Afghanistan and would fight side by side with Afghan Mujahideen leaders like Ahmed Shah Massoud. Heck, funny enough, Abdullah Azam at the start of his jihad in Afghanistan character arc development was very distrustful and dislike Ahmed Shah Massoud. This was due to all the factionalism within the Afghan Mujahideen factions that of course would rub onto the Afghan Arabs. Abdullah Azam would spend a lot of his time with Golden bin Hikmatyar and him and Ahmed Shah Massoud did not like each other. But when Abdullah Azam would travel into Afghanistan and meet with Ahmed Shah Massoud, Abdullah Azam would begin to befriend Ahmed Shah Massoud. And Abdullah Azam would like Ahmed Shah Massoud so much that he would declare Massoud the Napoleon of the 20th century. Abdullah Azam would even write a book praising Ahmed Shah Massoud and would even try to defend Ahmed Shah Massoud within Pasharwa. Another Afghan Mujahideen leader that would have positive relationships with Abdullah Azam and would fight side by side with Mech members like Osama bin Laden was Jalal al-Din Haqqani. And hopefully this will show you the spread of ideologies and viewpoints within Mech and the Afghan Mujahideen. But big shocker here, fighting in a war is not fun. Combat experience and training can be learned but friends will always be lost. And in the Battle of Zahwar, this was brutally shown to the Afghan Arabs. The Battle of Zahwar was especially a moving point for them. Even though the Mujahideen technically won the battle, they barely did. And many Afghan Arabs would see this battle as a humiliation overall. And this could be seen as a rift where the Afghan Arabs were beginning to split. Fighters who tended to like Abdullah Azam's viewpoint of following the Afghan leadership and that the Afghan Arab purpose in Afghanistan wasn't solely fighting, would begin to come into conflict with the more militarist minded Afghan Arabs. Afghan Arabs were now splitting. Fighters who tended to like Azam's approach saw no issue with the current setup which is that the Afghan Arabs are not only there to fight but are there to help the Afghans in any way. This would come into conflict with the more militarist Afghan Arabs who would see the Battle of Zahwar as a highlight of the failure of that viewpoint, feeling that the Afghan Arabs would now have to be more fierce and brutal and have more combat experience if they want to survive and prove themselves. Abu Hajr al-Iraqi would step down from his position as executive director for Mech. And within 1986, Osama bin Laden and Abu Hajr al-Iraqi would begin to work on forming the Saba Arab Training Camp aimed at militarily training Afghan Arabs. And at first this was done without Abdullah Azam knowing, independent of his control. But when you start setting up 
training camps full of Afghan Arabs, Abdullah Azam will find out one way or another. And this military camp was incorporated within Mecca. The Sabah Arab training camp was very effective. Arab fighters were sent off to Afghanistan where they would fight with the Mujahideen. The Sabah training camp would only see more division formed between the militarists and I guess what I'll be calling the non-militarists. Many militarist Afghan Arabs would feel that by incorporating this camp into Mecca, Mech was bringing in all their previously stated issues and drama into the training camp. And this is where you'd begin to see one of the biggest donors and members of Mech, Osama bin Laden, begin to slowly shift towards doing his own independent work. Osama bin Laden would end up creating the Mossad camp, also known as the Lion Den within Jaji, getting the blessing from Abdullah Azam in support from Mech. Random fact I'm gonna just shove in, did you know that Shi'i fighters would help Osama bin Laden form this camp? During this time, a lot of Afghan Arabs didn't mind getting help or helping Shi'i fighters. Big surprise here that later changed as time went on, but during this time, they really didn't care if they were Shi'is for the most part. No surprise here, when you make a training camp for militarists led by militarists, the camp will become a hotbed for militarists. No surprise here, Al Masada became a hotbed for militarists. When you have a lot of militarist people in one place, they tend to form hardline ideas. And I mean, we're already talking about guys who left their countries to fight in a combat zone for an ideological viewpoint already. So hardline on top of that. Many of the ideas and viewpoints and I guess what you could say organization could be applied to Al Qaeda today. Now, if you guys didn't notice on the map, the Mossad training camp is placed within Afghanistan. Heck, when people were building the Mossad training camp, a lot of folks would try to convince Bin Laden and Azam to not build the training camp because it's a very hard place to defend and it's also within a combat zone known as Afghanistan. But that did not stop Osama Bin Laden. No surprise here, setting up a rebel training camp in a combat zone tends to bring combat to it. Afghan Arabs would partake in the Battle of Jedji. Now while people might view this as one big battle, it wasn't. These were a series of battles that included the Mujahideen attacking Soviet and Afghan PDPA forces, along with them defending from Soviet and Afghan PDPA counterattacks. But I'm here to oversimplify, I'm not Kings in general. Go watch Kings in general if you want to see a more detailed fight and all that stuff. I know what my channel is, it's here to oversimplify very complex Muslim world politic and historical events, okay? Now the Battle of Jeji was a very intense and harsh battle. Afghan Arab reinforcements would even be called up to fight side by side with the militarist Afghan Arabs, including Abdullah Azam. By the end of the battle, Afghan Arabs and their Afghan allies stood victorious, while the communists and the Soviets would secede the land to Osama bin Laden and his lot. News of this Afghan Arab victory against one of the world's strongest superpowers, the Soviet Union, would begin to spread across the Muslim world like a wildfire. And this would only energize the Afghan Arabs in general, but the militarists in particular, as their victory began to spread. This victory would help glorify their cause in the eyes of many, and this would also help the Afghan Arabs gain more gun-ho recruits. The Afghan Arabs had fought for their stake in this world and won. The battle of Jaji to the Afghan Arabs was them proving themselves to everyone, including themselves. The battle of Zahwar could now be seen as a one-off event, but Jaji was the real test of their nerves while the Masada training camp would gain the nickname The Base or Al-Qaeda. Now, there is a tad bit of historical dispute over when exactly did this new secret organization I'm gonna name was formed, but for sure by 1988, militarists like Abu Hajr al-Iraqi and Osama bin Laden would begin to form a group calling themselves The Base or Al-Qaeda. Now, I should say something very important. People tend to call Abdullah Azam a founder of Al-Qaeda, no, no, he didn't. Already by this time, Abdullah Azam and Osama bin Laden were working pretty independent of each other. And on top of that, you could view Osama bin Laden and Abdullah Azam as the personification of the disputes and splits within the Afghan Arabs. I said by this quote I'm gonna pull up, the second part of our relationship with Osama bin Laden is when he started in 89 to take distance from Abdullah Azam, but not in a rude way or in a unacceptable way. Externally, the relationship seemed very fine. Very, very few people knew otherwise. 
no more than five or six people. Then I skipped through the quote a little bit. Our relationship as friends continued, but our relationship as a colleague of work completely stopped. This new Al Qaeda group at the start was used to train and organize the military Afghan Arabs with the aim of exporting these fighters around the world. This is something I would go against Abdullah Azam's viewpoint. As seen within this quote by Abdullah Azam's son, let me state clearly from now that before we started training in Afghanistan, we used to swear by the book of God that we would never use his training and technology against any Arab or Islamic state or any Arab or Islamic regime. My father made all trainees promise that they would not use their weapons in this way. But these two guys never cut their relationship between each other and well the war continued. And as the war went on and due to the failure at the Battle of Jalalabad where many Afghan Arabs were killed and the city remained in communist rule, the Afghan Arabs would only continue to see fractures between them. But just like in Vietnam, this war did not care about the conventional front but the insurgency and guerrilla warfare. And by 1989, the Soviets would pull out of Afghanistan. And now the Islamists in general, but the Afghan Arabs in particular, lost their common foe while all of their causes were being questioned by each other. And paradise belongs to the pious and firm, to God we belong, and to him we return. We say to God we belong, and to him we return. Of Afghanistan and of Islam, 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 of Afghanistan and of Islam. Muhammad Rasulullah, alayhi salatullah.